Interestingly enough, before I knew I was going to communicate those changes to you, I had already written the beginning of, uh, of my message, which is about change. In fact, we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about change today. Change happens, doesn't it? I mean, it just does. It, it happens, uh, and we all know it, we all feel it. Our kids get older. You can't just keep them. Our, our little one ran in the bed this morning, and there was a time when he ran in the bed, and it was all sweet and nice. This morning he ran in the bed, and his legs were draped over my head, and his face was snotty all over Jen. It's just, it had lost its cuteness. And I can only imagine when he's 23 or 24, that's, that just won't be a fun experience at all. Um, so as our kids get older, life changes and, and those things happen. As our relationships evolve, the, the day that you said I do or the day that she said yes when you ask her on the first date or vice versa, those moments, that relationship changed. It evolved. Change kind of happens and goes on. Our circumstances change. Your circumstances are probably different today than they were yesterday. Then they were a month ago. Then, then they're going to be, you know, six weeks from now. Change happens all around us because life, life itself refuses to stay still. It does. There's, there's no way to make life stay still. And how much you like change or like the change that goes on usually depends on your personality. Some of you have the personality that you just, you just hate change. Even me talking about change and bringing these few changes up, you're just, you feel it on the inside. You're almost locked up now. You, you probably won't be able to do anything for the rest of the day because we, we have thrown change out there. You, you love routine in your life. You know, you're, you're doing your thing. You get up in the morning. You've got your coffee. You get dressed. You eat, you eat breakfast. You drive on the road. Same route, never different. Uh, drive to work. You do your thing. You come home. You read the paper. You talk to the kids. 12, 13 words. Uh, then you go to bed and you're done and you repeat and rinse and repeat and rinse because you love routine and, and it's your thing. And some of you that are married to this person are going, oh, yes, that the root and heaven forbid you mess up their routine. My dad was that way. Uh, it was just kind of how he worked. Now, there are those of us that the change is just something we love. I mean, we, we just love to mix it up. We're always changing things. We never drive the same way to work. Sometimes it's because we're a little paranoid, but still, we, we just like change. We change things in our house. Some of you have changed the inside of your house color 27 times in the past week, just because. And so you, you change things in your house, you change things in your life and, and your circumstances. You love change. You never watch the same movie twice. You love meeting new people in new places because your old friends are old friends and you're ready for something new. And so you have fully embraced change and you love it and, and it's a part of who you are. So you tend to fall in those two groups. Yeah, yeah. Love and change, not love and change. There's sometimes a mixture of the two, but, but basically we handle change those two ways. And that even bleeds over to church. There, there are folks that just absolutely, and there's no right or wrong in these next two, by the way, uh, there are folks that just absolutely love tradition. I mean, they love the tradition, what's familiar, that Martin Luther did it that way, and so I really don't see why we should change anything about that. And you just embrace the familiar about doing the same thing every week. And we have some of those experiences in church that are the same and familiar. We come in and we sing, and there's communion, and there's a preacher, and those are good. But some of you, man, you're all about change. You would mix it up every Sunday. You, you would be doing something different every Sunday of the week if you could. The only good tradition to you is a dead tradition. Um, the, the, what you should, probably should do with a sacred cow is make a hamburger out of it. That's, that's your passion and your hope. And so you're, you're wanting all kind of change in your life. And so now the good thing about First Christian is we have both those kind of people here. We're, we're a church that's been here for a long time. So we have those folks that love the familiar, that love the tradition, and we have some of those, and, and we have those folks that love change, and so we try to mix it up. So we try to bring both of you guys together uh, on a Sunday to worship. It's not easy, but we're working at it. Now here's the good news. Having talked about the change and, and the things that go on, the good news is this, is that there are some things, as much as life demands that, that things move and evolve, there are some things that don't change. And we're going to spend a little time talking about those this morning. And those some things that don't change are kind of the core of who we are as Christ followers. The first one is this, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? 
That doesn't change. In fact, John 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and then the Word became flesh and, and dwelt among us. Who's this Word guy? Was, it was that Microsoft's first attempt at uh, you know, a, a, a program? No, the Word was Jesus. In the beginning was Jesus, and, and Jesus was God, and, and then he became flesh, and, and he dwelt among us. How cool is that? That is who he is. He is God, and that doesn't change. That doesn't change. No matter what happens in life and your circumstances, that Jesus is God, that he's the Savior, does not change. The gospel doesn't change. The, this message that we have, that, uh, that what we embrace is a very powerful truth. Paul said it this way, and I'm going to give you uh, second, 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15 says this, 15.3. For this is what I received. This is Paul talking to us. For what I received, I passed on to you of first importance. This is the most important thing I can tell you. That Christ died for our sins according to Scripture. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to Scripture. So he's telling the people, this is what the gospel is. This is, this is what it is that doesn't change about what we believe. And, and he wrote in Romans 10, 9, if you confess through your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead, then guess what? You've got redemption. Those are, are two key pieces about what we believe that doesn't change. Now, how we present it does I mean, do you guys remember flannel graph? Any flannel graphers in the house? Yeah, some of you just went back to that happy spot. Yeah, flannel graph. You remember it and how your little teacher put up the, the lamb and the thing and the stuck, and it was just the most beautiful thing ever. Well, well we don't do flannel graph anymore. Now we have video, and, and we have lights, and, and uh, Twitter, and all those things to communicate the gospel. The gospel didn't change. How we communicate it did. In fact, a, a pastor once said this, and I love it. He, he said this, that, uh, that we don't change the gospel in how we present it, but the gospel always, always, always changes us. So those are two of the truths that I know that we can hold on to, who Jesus is in the middle of all the change that we're experiencing and what the gospel is. Now, here's the core of the message. Here's where it actually gets to connecting with what I want to talk about this morning. There's something else about Jesus that doesn't change. Something that I absolutely love, that you can hold on to rock solid, and it is this simple truth right here, that Jesus desires to walk with us in everyday life. Just let it settle. That doesn't change. God doesn't one day wake up and go, you know, I want to hang out with someone else today. I, I want to go do something else today. His heart is toward us for those that, that are choosing to follow Christ. He desires to walk with us in everyday life. He wants to be there with you, cheering you on in your epic moments. When you do it right in, in your relationships, when, when you wake up and, and you do the things that, that your spouse you know, resonates love with you, when you go, man, what? Wow, I did it right. He is there cheering for you. When, when you do it right, living outside of yourself and being, being more than, than who you thought you could be, doing what God's called you to do, He is there cheering for you. Almost the, the supernatural fist bump, just giving it to you as you're doing these amazing things in life. So He is there walking with you, cheering you on in your epic moments. He is also there walking with us and our struggles, and our stresses. And those times in life when things get heavy, when, when we feel the weight of the brokenness around us, you ever been there when you're just walking through life and circumstances and situations, and you go, oh my goodness, this world's a broken world. He is there to walk with us. Desires, it's never going to change in his heart that he desires to walk with us in the brokenness around us, and even the brokenness within us. That he is there walking with us and all the things that, that we walk through, even in our own brokenness, he's there for us. And, and Jesus goes beyond just being the casual observer. He, he's not there just getting the emails. Oh, okay, good, good to know. Good to know. They messed up today. I'll, I'll write it down. He, he's not there as a casual observer. Christ is there to walk with us, to care for us, to minister to us, both in our successes and the triumphs and, um, and the, the good things of life, but also in the sorrows and the despair moments. He is there with us, to walk with us, to minister to us. In fact, that is one of the reasons that he embraced humanity. 
You ever wonder when I started with that phrase, in, in the beginning was Jesus, and Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God, and then Jesus became flesh. Why, why did he do that? Why, why couldn't he have just stood up there from the throne and just kind of waved his arm and said, forgiven, and boom, forgiveness just kind of rolled out, and we just enjoyed it. Why, why did he have to come do this thing called life? There's obviously a bunch of theological things we can talk about redemption, but there's something else here that I want to give you this morning. This is found in Hebrews. We're going to camp here for a little while. Hebrews chapter 2. And we're also going to turn over to chapter 4. It simply says this. In Christ, two shared in their humanity, our humanity, so that by his death... He might destroy him who holds the power of death. That is the devil. So the first reason he became human was so that, so that he could, in, 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 in that form, destroy the thing that, that binds us, which is death in this life, which Adam introduced. And the one that holds that is the devil. He destroyed that. Then in verse 15, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. That when we embrace Christ, we don't have to fear death. That we know that we have life eternal in Him. And so He brought freedom for us. And so there's the redemption picture. But verse 16 gives us another picture of why He embraced humanity for us. And it's simply this. For surely it is not angels that He helps. He doesn't hang out with angels and go, what do you need today? What, what's going on in your, in your angelic life? How do, th- that wing's broken. We can totally fix that today. He, he's not here to help the angels. He's here to help Abraham's descendants, and that's you and I. For this reason, he had to be made like his brothers in every way in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest. Underline that. He became like us so that he can minister to us in our highs and our lows, so that he could be a merciful and faithful high priest, so that when we come to him and our struggles, he knows what those struggles are, not because he, he's seen it in other people, but because he has walked it himself. He's a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, that he might make atonement for the sins of the people for sure, but also that he himself suffered when he was tempted and he faced trials, and now he is able to help those who are being tempted and face trials ourselves. He became human to know us, to know our struggles and, and, and our life and our successes so that he could walk with us in a very intimate and very real way. And, and it goes on in chapter 4, verse 14. It says this, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith that we profess For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who is tempted in every way that we are. And just as we were tempted, yet he was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and grace that we find in him in our time of need. We have a God who loves us. We have a God who redeemed us, who knows what it's like to live this life. And because he knows what it's like to live this life that we experience, he can walk with us. And he's passionate about walking with us. And the circumstances that we face, and that is a powerful thing because he can truly shepherd us. He can truly comfort us. He is the one that can really minister to our heart and our soul. I think that's a powerful powerful truth for us today. A lot of us, we, we walk in here and we carry a lot of stuff and a lot of things and we go, you know what, this is, this is my, my burden, these are my trials, these are my, my hurts and my pains and, and I don't even know what to do with it. I don't, I don't even know if God even understands what I'm going through and, and I'm here to tell you this, He does because He has walked there and He knows it and He is committed. It's the one thing that doesn't change about Him to be a faithful and merciful minister and carer of your soul. It's a beautiful truth that I know about God. Now, typically, I I dive into a story here. I tell you a story that related to my life and those kind of things, but we started with change, and so I'm going to do something different this morning to emphasize that, hey, we're talking about change today. Um, I'm going to show you a video. Now, this video um, is of someone that knows success, and no struggle, um, and how God met him in his journey. And you're probably going to recognize him, especially for you Olympian fans out there. He's a gold medal winner. Um, he's the one that started, uh, I think, Stars on Ice. He's an amazing um, journey in life. 
and, and he's also had some struggles in who he is. His name's Scott Hamilton, and he has a beautiful, amazing story about a walk with God. I'm going to take the next few minutes and show you his story. I don't think anyone's truly equipped to go out in front of a billion, two billion, three billion people on an Olympic stage, and you're scared out of your mind. On a 200 by 100 surface of ice, you wonder why you do this because you're so nervous. On two 10 inch lengths of quarter inch wide steel, through this, just get me through this. And you're to manipulate those edges for four and a half minutes and do triple jumps and athleticism and not make a mistake. It's impossible. But I found a way to be just, just good enough <laughs> to win the gold medal. The more I look back on it, I think it's unbelievably awesome. Like, that was me. You know, I always thought if I could be really good on the ice, you know, I could become famous. <laughs> I, I think I'm probably more known for my health problems now than I am for anything I ever did um, on skates. When I was very little, I suffered from a disease that stopped me from growing. It was in and out of hospitals for years, and I was never really home. And so what ended up happening was I came back from kind of being in and out of hospitals, and I ended up going to the skating club thing just by accident. And I found skating, which kind of took on a life of its own, and, and it progressed. And pretty soon I'm competing. Pretty soon I'm living away from home. All my role models and, and the people that were teaching me how to live day to day were older skaters. So there was a lot of it that was terrific, but a lot of it that really um, wasn't guiding me in, in any real direction. It wasn't until I suffered the devastation of my mother losing her battle to cancer that something was awakened in me. I knew I needed something more, something better. I think I needed to have uh, some strength. and. My mother um, was my source of strength. When she was living, I would disappoint her. But when she, when she was gone, I, I just didn't ever want to be less than she thought I could be. I was happy to just work. I was happy to just entertain. I do well, and I think that was that was good enough. Skating had given me life as a child, and it given me, you know, kind of a strength as an adult. But what was about to happen uh, really changed my life forever. You know, cancer it put me into a phase of my life where I just needed to kind of sort it all out. I just survived something. Why? I, I survived something that took the most important person in my life off the planet. That was my mother. She died of cancer and I survived. What's my purpose now? What, what do I need to do? What, how do I? And a big part of that dust settling was getting with Tracy. And she brought me to the church. She took me to a minister, a man named Ken Durham. And the first thing he, he said to me, which was, was extraordinary, was he goes, you have to understand that Christianity is, is a faith of history. These things actually happened. And I go, OK, that's a good starting off point. And just study what has happened and, and see how that resonates in your own life. And it grew. It just sort of. It's like, OK, I get it. When you survive testicular cancer um, and you want to start a family, you don't know what the issues are going to be. And um, I prayed that I, I would someday become a father. Tracy and I, we got engaged and married. And then my son was born nine months and two days after we got married. <laughs> so I guess there was a plan there. I thought I paid my health dues when I had cancer, but this was a whole other issue. 
uh, have a brain tumor. How do I tell my wife? And we have a 14-month-old son. How do, I, how do I tell my wife that I have a brain tumor? I'd just gotten the news an hour before. I met them at the hotel, and I, she goes, what's going on? And I said, I have a brain tumor. And she took my hands, and without hesitation, she just started to pray. And it was in that moment I knew where I was going to put everything. My trust, my faith, everything. It's so the most powerful moment of my life. From that moment forward, we just said, whatever it is, whatever it takes, we'll face this. When they're gonna do a biopsy, they tell you, we're gonna drill a hole in your head, and then we're gonna take um, a needle down through your brain and take a piece of the tumor. <laughs> they said, we seem to have I've found a safe corridor <laughs> to do this. And I go, well, I'm not using most of it, but um, they tell you all the things that can go wrong in that surgery. And I remember waking up and I looked at the clock and it was 10.20. I knew where I was. And then the next thing I saw was my wife come in with a smile on her face. She said, they know what it is. And they found out that that brain tumor was one that I was born with, one that I'd had since birth, which inhibited my growth as a young child. That was the mysterious illness I had that they never diagnosed that got me into skating. Who would I be? without a brain tumor. I'm five foot four. If I were five eight, if I would have grown those years, five ten, where would I be? Who would I be? I could choose to look at it as debilitating, could choose to focus on the suffering. I choose to look at that brain tumor as the greatest gift I could have gotten because it made everything else possible. I didn't see past it this time. I didn't think I would survive. One point I was starting to really feel weak. And one nurse in particular, I was up at 3 o'clock in the morning, and I just was uncomfortable. And she was, can, can I get you anything? And I, I just said, no. I go, I'm just a little scared. She said, do you pray? I said, yes. And she said, what do you say when you pray? I go, well, I just, I just thank God for all the blessings in my life. Do you ask him for anything? No. I just, I just want him to know I'm grateful. I'm grateful. Well, who is God to you? And I said, well, I, I guess he's, he's my father. Oh, you're a father, right? Yes. If one of your children were hurting, wouldn't you want him to come to you for comfort, strength? Yes. So I changed the way I pray now. I ask, uninhibitedly, I ask. I ask to heal. I ask for strength. I ask for courage. I ask for another child. I want to talk about miracles. It's after surviving the pituitary brain tumor. It's impossible, practically impossible. I did six injections a week for two years. No luck. We're not meant to have another child. We gave that to God. A month later, we found out that Max was on his way. Miracle Max. When I look back and I see all those little moments in my life where 
I needed a great deal of strength. I understand that through a strong relationship with Jesus, you can endure anything. I just learned that the only true disability in life is a bad attitude. God is there to guide you through the tough spots. God was there every single time. <laughs> every single time. My name is Scott Hamilton, and I am second. Scott said something that was so true, and I think what resonated with me when I, when I saw the video, and it was simply this, God is there to guide you through the tough spots. So powerful, so true. He chose to live this life so he can understand what our tough spots are, uh, so he could be to us that merciful and faithful Savior. I'm not sure what you carry this morning. I know we all carry something. Stresses, depression, discouragement, sickness, hurt, heartache, disappointment, loss of hope. And if you don't carry that, then I know you carry something for someone else. We have people uh, that we care about that hurt. And as much as they carry their weight, we carry that weight with them. And when I watched that video, the reason I wanted to do this message this morning because I thought, man, in this season of life in our church, it seems like there's a lot of people that carry the weight. that have things that, that are heavy, that know people that are hurting. And I thought, watching that, wow, God is there. He's there to walk with us through the tough spots. He's there to carry us. He's there to offer us what we don't have within ourselves. In fact, this is the unchanging truth. Your Savior wants to walk with you, and He's there to give you strength, no matter what it is that you're journeying with. I'm going to wrap up with Isaiah 41, verses 9 and 10. I'm going to show you verse 10, but I'm going to give you 9 too. And, and then we're going to take some time where we're just going to pray this morning. It simply says this, I took you from the ends of the earth. From the farthest corners I called you. I have said you are my servant and I have chosen you and I have not rejected you. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God, and I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you with my righteous right hand. The message is honestly simple this morning. It's simply this. One is that He has called us from the Father's corners. You are here this morning because God has called you from the Father's corners of Santa Maria, the Father's corners from California, the Father's corners of this world. He has called you, and He has been in pursuit of you, looking for you, drawing you in. And the second part, He has chosen us, and He's not rejected us, no matter what the world says about God. And they say some horrific things about Him that aren't true. Know this, God loves you, He knows you, and He wants to be in relationship with you. That He is passionate about connecting with you and walking with you, and He's just waiting for that moment that you figure out those other truths, that Jesus is real and the gospel is unchanging, and it's a matter of us surrendering our life to Him and saying, God, I want to follow you. And that means walking with Him in the successes and the incredible things of life, but having someone who can walk with you through the struggles and the heartache that invariably come. And this last part is, is what I love and kind of what's resonating with my heart this morning. I'll read verse 10 to you again. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. 
and I will strengthen you and help you, and I will hold you up with my righteous right hand. If you are willing to lean into God this morning, and maybe that looks like for you just simply saying, God, I need you. My circumstances are overwhelming. My, my health is, 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 is not good. I'm struggling. There's pain in my relationship. There's pain emotionally in my life. God, I can't do this thing. Even as a Christ follower, I'm struggling. I, I need help. Maybe it's just you taking a moment and leaning in and saying, God, your strength, your righteous right hand needs to hold me today. And just letting him do that. Not holding him out here at arm's distance. I got this, God. I got this. I've got, I've got, I've got everything else that I need. But not doing that. But letting him step in and like a good father, wrap his arms around your heart and your life. Speak love and grace and hope to your heart in a supernatural way that I can't explain. I think that's what God offers us this morning. It's, it's what he gives us. When we need strength, he is there with us. I'm going to invite our worship team to come on up this morning. And, and here's another change thing. We're going to do something a little different. Before we go into the tradition of communion, I want to give you a moment where you just go to God and you simply seek his face. Or you're just simply asking. Maybe you're, you're walking great and fine and you don't need that strength, but you know someone else does. Lift them up to God. Maybe for you, you know you do and, and, and you need surrender or you need hope. You, you need God just to, just to hold you today. Let him do that in these next few moments. These guys are just going to play quietly. I invite you just to, just to bow your heads, close your eyes. Take a few minutes with God, and then I'm going to pray for us. And then we're going to have communion together. We'll have some ushers and leaders in the back if you would like someone else to pray with you also this morning. Father, hear our voice. We come before you as a people that are in need, in need of your righteous right hand to hold us in our relationships, your righteous right hand to hold us in our struggles and in our doubt. Father, we're just a real people, and, and this life isn't easy, and things change all around us. And so, Father, Speak to our hearts this morning. The men in here that need hope in their relationship, hope in their life, hope in, in this journey that they're walking, Father, give that to them. The gals that are they're looking for hope in their relationship and, and hope in who they are. And maybe there's people that are hurting. Holy Spirit, you do a ministering work to them. I pray healing of heart, soul, mind, and body this morning. That as we step in your presence, Father, what we know is that you are a real God that changes us and changes lives. And we are doing the unusual this morning. We are stopping to talk to you. To have you minister to us in a supernatural way. Father, we are your people and we stand in your presence now asking you to minister to us our hopes and our needs. We just lay them right there before you, Father. Your healing in our lives, in our souls, in our relationships. We love you, Jesus. And thank you that you walk with us. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, the one who never changes, the one who's always there, the one who desires to walk with us in the ups and downs of life. In his name, we ask all of these things. In his name we pray, amen.